I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free. I want to build on that topic of being as uh, a way into a very deep and powerful topic that has the fancy term equanimity, but it really is about an unshakable, resilient well-being and inner freedom in your core, no matter what's happening. And how do we actually develop that trait over time? Really useful. And for me personally, I can share with you, you're my primary community of practice, really. Um, this may be your primary of, uh, community of practice as well. And we're, we're practicing together. And I can share with you that as I looked out into the new year, a few weeks ago and just sort of reflected on uh, a theme or two or three that might be especially relevant for me, what came forward was equanimity. Equanimity, underlying peacefulness in which disturbances are contained. Um, so this is especially relevant in our relationships. Uh, as Ellen Watts put it, life is wiggly and Meanwhile, we've got a brain that's designed to react to the wiggliness of threats, the wiggliness of opportunities, going to go chase that carrot, and the wiggliness of other people. And it's especially designed to react, the brain is, to threats and opportunities that involve other people because we're profoundly social. And what's going on in your brain moment to moment is that two parts in particular, the hippocampus and amygdala, deep in the subcortex, kind of the middle layer in your brain, deep inside, originating more or less around 200 million years ago with some modifications since, but a very fundamental and ancient part of the brain. The amygdala and hippocampus are continually tracking what the Buddha pointed out, and modern psychology has pointed out, as the hedonic tones of experience. Uh, it's sometimes translated as the feeling tones of experience, but probably a better translation is hedonic tones because these tones of experience are not about emotion per se. So if the hedonic tone is unpleasant, that tends to signal a threat. If the hedonic tone is pleasant, that tends to signal an opportunity. And sometimes we see threats and opportunities with other people, and in my view, actually we're beginning to evolve a kind of subtle hedonic tone that you can gradually recognize. You can gradually tease it apart from pleasant and unpleasant. It's what I call relational. You're not moving away from what's unpleasant or toward what's pleasant, you're resting in relatedness. And based on that hedonic tone in these quarter second evaluations by the amygdala and the hippocampus, uh, a reaction is initiated. Typically, if there's a threat, that reaction is fight, flight, freeze. If there is a um, hedonic tone or of the signal's opportunity, then we move into pursuit or drivenness, chasing. Uh, and if the hedonic tone or otherwise we recognize there's relatedness, then we tend to move into attaching, bonding, even clinging with associated emotions, threats, fear, anger, right? Maybe a sense of helplessness, being powerless, opportunity, Maybe a sense of anticipatory delight, well, often frustration, disappointment, uh, maybe a sense of addictive drivenness. And then if there's relationship, oh, maybe anticipation of love or you know something romantic or erotic. Often there's a sense of envy, resentment, hurt, guilt or shame. This is normal. Mother Nature evolved these systems 
This is Neurobiology, Evolutionary Neurobiology 101. And in the wild, Mother Nature's plan is for her little creatures to be able to tolerate brief bursts of stress that are surrounded mainly by long periods of rest and repair and refueling. And that's the template of Mother Nature in the wild, in which, as Robert Sapolsky wrote in his book, Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers, in the wild, where most episodes of stress end quickly, one way or another. But we modern humans, especially in the way we live today, are experiencing mild to moderate chronic stress with very little opportunity or, very, or fairly brief periods of complete whew, letting down that our animal uh, cousins, non-human animal cousins, are able to experience most of the time. And this kind of chronic, mild to moderate stress has lots of well-established bad consequences for um, long-term health and well-being. It exposes us in the term to allostatic load, the gradual accumulating wear and tear of feeling frazzled, irritated, frustrated, exasperated, blocked, disappointed, hurt, let down, lonely, lonely. As our kids used to put it when they were really little, ronery. <laughs> Are you feeling ronery? Yeah. You know, loneliness. And the wonderful current Surgeon General, Vivek Murthy, has pointed out that the health risks of chronic loneliness are equivalent to smoking half a pack of cigarettes a day. It's that serious. So that's what we're exposed to. What can we do? This is where equanimity comes in. You may have experienced some equanimity in the meditation we just did. Equanimity involves a kind of spaciousness in which there's non-reactivity to whatever is passing through awareness. If calm is not having any reactions, equanimity is not reacting to your reactions. The hedonic tone is a kind of reaction. The pleasantness of this, the unpleasantness of that, that's a reaction to it. In equanimity, we're in an undisturbed field or spaciousness that is not reacting to whether we like something or dislike something. It's there. The liking and disliking are there, the pleasant and the unpleasant are there, but we're not reacting to them. They don't invade us and control us when we're in a state of equanimity. In a, in a sense, you're kind of resting in the shock absorber. This is unpleasant, that's pleasant, this is relational, I like this, I don't like that, and yet you're not controlled by that. That's equanimity, kind of in the shock absorber. Pretty good. In effect, we're undisturbed underneath the disturbance. This is a way of being really open in life, really passionate, living openly with a large heart without, while still being fundamentally at peace and content with a warm heart in the core of your being. That's, that's the invitation of the Buddha. That's the invitation we're found in other ways and other traditions, certainly, but that is, um, is, is such a beautiful opportunity for all of us. So how do we cultivate it, right? I'm gonna to get to that in a second. Um, equanimity is highly valued in Buddhism, certainly. Uh, the term for it in one of the key languages of early Buddhism, Pali, is upekka. Somebody might wanna put that into the chat. U-P-E-K-K-H-A, upekka. And upekka, equanimity, is one of the so-called four Brahma-viharas. 
These are the dwelling places of awakening consciousness. And the four include compassion, kindness, happiness at, at the happiness of others, and equanimity. And it is said that equanimity is the foundation of the other three. Because if we are to sustain compassion, we need equanimity. Otherwise, we get so disturbed by the suffering in others and ourselves that we're become that we're aware of in compassion. Um, equanimity enables a sustained kindness, including an orientation of kindness for toward you know or a fundamental um, non-harming, a fundamental absence of in, ill will toward others. How do we maintain that? You need equanimity. How do you maintain happiness for what others have that you may lack? Need equanimity. It's interesting. At Spirit Rock Meditation Center, uh, where I really kind of reconnected with Buddhism around 30 years ago after an early introduction to it when I was younger, um, if you ever go there uh, and you go on retreat there, so you're spending the night, they have these four dormitories. And they are named after each one of the four as you walk up the hill toward the upper retreat hall where you practice most of the time. Uh, they are named after the four Brahma Viharas. So you start at, I believe, Karuna, compassion, Metta, loving kindness. I may have switched the order of those. Mudita for um, altruistic joy, sympathetic joy, it's sometimes called happiness at the welfare of others. Finally, with Upeka, which is the last one up the hill. And I'm sure somebody, you know, named them in that order, because in a sense, Upeka um, is perhaps the hardest to develop. Uh, it takes practice to develop, uh, because in, in effect, you're overcoming some of our own evolved neurobiology, which is not designed to be um, equanimous when we're being jostled by life, right? Uh, and it's, it's kind of funny that I never spent the night in that upper building. <laughs> so <laughs> that's why I need, obviously, to work on Upeka. I need to work on equanimity. Maybe finally then, it'll be my own abode, my own dwelling place. Anyway, so equanimity, one of the four attributes of awakening consciousness, right there with compassion, kindness, and happiness for others, uh, and arguably the foundation of being able to sustain those other three. Equanimity is also one of the seven factors of enlightenment, of awakening, along with uh, investigation, mindfulness, effort or energy, tranquility, bliss, concentration, and equanimity. Equanimity matters. It's important. Okay, so how can you develop it? And as I talk about this, you might hear me say things that you've heard before that you're already practicing. Great, it's all good. And ask yourself, what might add new value that I'm talking about to your practice, all right? So tip number one, encouragement number one, is mindfulness of the hedonic tone. This is actually one of the four establishments of mindfulness that is a foundational practice in, in Buddhism. And the Buddha allocated one of the four to Mindfulness of the hedonic tones. Pleasant, unpleasant, I like this, I don't like that. Um, I feel in relationship with this. Neither pleasant, unpleasant, nor relational, fine. Mindfulness of that in an ongoing way is incredibly helpful. Because if we're not mindful of those things, in a sense of stability of present moment awareness, we get swept away, right? Carried away. And in this mindfulness, we can be very aware of related qualities that are in the body. It's really been helpful for me to recognize the sense of contraction around something, a feeling of tension in the body, a sense of pressure, or a quality of insistence, must, have to. It has to be this way. I have to get that. 
I have to get that done. Rick, you have to, have to, have to, that inner voice, right? As soon as you get that sense of pressured insistence, ding, 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 yellow flag time. And then you can start to look, what's that in reaction to? It's in reaction to some kind of hedonic tone that hooked you. I must have this that I like. I must get away from that which I don't like. I must get closer to them or I must impress them or I must get approval from them. Oh, as soon as you're in that, yellow flag. That's not equanimity. Being mindful of that though is a, is a factor of equanimity. It's the beginning of equanimity because you get some breathing room, some air, some distance from that part of you that's really going full speed. Now, maybe that breathing room is only in 1% of you because 99% of you is fully into it. But that 1% of you is a refuge from which you can look at the rest and gradually build out that 1% that recognizes, I have those reactions. I don't need to be those reactions. Those reactions can arise in my mind. They arise, they're there, but they don't need to invade me and control me and occupy me. I don't need to collude with them. I don't need to believe them. I don't need to join with them and even fuel them and feed them and identify with them. I don't need to do those things. That's equanimity. Can we be aware, for example, also of speeding up, accelerating? We live in a culture that's very much about acceleration. Do you know what the number two commodity is worldwide that has the number two dollar value in you know, world trade. Think of all the commodities, all the stuff, iron, rice, pork bellies, wheat, gold, right? What's the number two commodity, dollar value worldwide? It's coffee, coffee. What do you think the number one is? Petroleum, <laughs> two forms of speed, right? Now, maybe coffee is sunk to number three, I don't know, but it's shocking, isn't it? So speed, think of, you could feel that accelerating. I tend to accelerate really quickly. I've had to really learn. I've got a Ferrari engine under the hood. I just breathe on the gas pedal. I'm going faster. I'm thinking faster. I'm talking faster. I'm moving faster, I'm getting stuff done faster. A lot of rewards in being fast, right? A lot of rewards in speeding up. Um, you know, there's a place for speeding up when it's okay. This is not about suppressing desires. It's about not being hijacked. It's not being a puppet pulled by the strings of various reactions to various things. So speeding up is another indicator. Taking it personally, hoy, self-righteousness. These are indicators that indicate that we're getting carried away by some reaction to a hedonic tone. Can we witness these things without resisting them, without chasing after them, without identifying with them, without being hijacked by them? This is fundamental practice, fundamental practice. These all might be very familiar to you. You've heard the lecture, right? <laughs> you read the book, you went on retreat, you've got the t-shirt to show it. And how granular, in terms of space and time, in terms of the space of your experiential field, how granular, and in terms of time, rapid events, like half a second or a second inside your own mind, how granular is your real-time mindfulness? How granular is your real-time awareness of the hijacking process in your own brain, in your own mind? And it gets more and more interesting to start to catch yourself more and more quickly after you've been carried away. You know, I started out, <laughs> I realized I've been carried away for years. <laughs> then I became more aware that I've been carried away for months and then weeks 
And then when it's practice matures, you realize you've been carried away for a day and a half there, some reaction about another person. Then you realize more and more, oh, I've been carried away for an hour. I've been carried away for a dozen minutes. I've been carried away for a few minutes. Can you get it to a few seconds? And then even, can you be so centered in real-time granular mindfulness that you can observe it arising? It's trying to get you. It's trying to take you away. And there's some spaciousness around it. It doesn't carry you away. It arises. A reaction arises, but it doesn't carry you away. Where are you you at with that kind of real-time mindfulness? That's the foundation of autonomy, inner freedom, self-respect, coping, functioning, success, and a resilient happiness, no matter what's happening. Could you get any better at that kind of real-time granular mindfulness? I'm still working on it. Second major suggestion, inner refuges, right? So the reaction's arising, it's trying to grab us. We're, We're mindful of it. Where are we standing? From where are we looking? at the thing that's pulling us this way and that. You know, I think um, lots of times, maybe you've been in mindfulness situations and people say, just be mindful. Yeah, great. I can be mindful for about two seconds after that person yelled at me, but after that, whoa, I wanna go to war, right? Or something like that. You know, just being mindful alone is not that helpful if you don't have a stable, established place from which you can stand, in which you are not the reaction, the storm passing through your mind. So what are some refuges? As as you probably know from my own work, it's really helpful to repeatedly internalize experiences of calm strength, of the felt sense that you're basically all right right now when it's true, so that increasingly you are able to rest in the trait of calm strength, which makes you much less easily manipulated by threat and hedonic tones of things being unpleasant. It's also really helpful to repeatedly, like, I'm serious, several times a day, for a breath or longer, rest in a sense of gratitude, contentment. There is enough in the present. You could still pursue goals. It's still nice to have more. There are additional things to like, some of them to actually have. And meanwhile, can you repeatedly internalize and hardwire into yourself an inner refuge of feeling basically content? content, already full in the core of your being. Extremely important. There's a lot in Buddhism and there's a lot in modern trauma psychology about building up inner refuges. Yes, outer refuges are good. And yes, obviously, alongside inner equanimity is do what we can to make the world around us better, including influencing other people to the extent we can. But meanwhile, in terms of inner practice, we can grow inner refuges. Or a third inner refuge alongside calm strength and contentment is, um, and to be clear, by the way, you can feel content in in a fundamental sense, even while feeling quite sad or disappointed or frustrated about things not going well in your life, or how you've been mistreated and blocked, including through forms of bias or prejudice, or doors that were just never going to be open for you. All right, All that can be really true. We can still have ambition. We can still be outraged at injustice. Can, all that can be true while somehow deep down inside, way down deep, or way at the center of it all, there can really be this sense of being content. 
And when that's true and you can rest in that, then you're not going to be so readily hijacked by um, things that are pleasant or blocks to getting what's pleasant. And then third major refuge, the heart. A fundamental resting in goodwill, good-heartedness, open-heartedness. Doesn't mean you let people take advantage of you. Doesn't mean you're a chump. Doesn't mean you fail to see people clearly. Just that you're rested fundamentally in a kind of open-heartedness that feeds you and protects you. Do it for them and especially do it for yourself. Wow. Through repeatedly internalizing experiences of ordinary, authentic, open-heartedness, kindness, lovingness, so that more and more, this is rested in you. And then alongside these three, these wonderful, very embodied, very emotional, you know, refuges that gradually start to color your mind and you start resting more and more in a mood, a mood of peacefulness, contentment and love in your being. That's a mood. Those are moods. And you can rest in a kind of blending of those. Along with that, a fourth extremely valuable refuge is insight into the nature of all experiences. What is the nature of all hearing, all seeing, all imagining, all remembering, all thinking, all feeling, all wanting, all sensing, all tasting, all smelling? What's the nature of all experiences? This is one of the central creative uh, original contributions of Siddhartha the Buddha. The nature of all experiences is that they are made of parts that are connected and changing. So that, therefore, they are empty of solidity and any kind of independent nature. And therefore, because all experiences have this quality of being insubstantial and changing, they slip through our fingers as soon as we are aware of them. They are incapable of being grasped and possessed for some kind of permanent happiness. And in that insight, we start to realize that we need to hold our experiences more lightly, that it's doomed and full of pain to try to hold on to them and keep them. We need to let them keep flowing, and we need to realize that um, there's no fundamental maker of those experiences. They're just happening, including the experience of oneself. That experience of being oneself is also empty in the sense of being made of parts that are connected and changing. And with that insight in Pali, vipassana, deepening, more and more we become kind of disenchanted with experience. Not negative about it, just untricked by it. We're not carried away by the magical spell that, oh, if I only had this, I'd be, I'd be happy. We cannot, find ha we cannot find any lasting happiness in transient experiences. We can't claim them. We can't own them. We can't keep them. And it's our chasing after them and trying to own them and trying to keep them that causes so much of our suffering. So that's the fourth refuge inside yourself, insight into the nature of experiences. You lighten up about them. They're there. They're interesting. They rise. They pass away. None of them are you. <laughs> you lighten up. Okay. Third, alongside mindfulness of the hedonic tones and growing refuges inside, third, for equanimity, um, is an underlying sense of being, which we explored here. In other words, as you really become more in touch with, you get more ac and you have more access to, it's more and more an ongoing aspect of your own stream of consciousness, a sense of underlying being. 
beingness. You know? Then that's a fundamental basis for equanimity because it's increasingly stable. Awareness is stable. It's undisturbed, even if what's passing through it is very disturbing. Awareness is stable. Being is stable as being. Doing keeps changing. We're doing this or that. Becoming, we're trying to you know, make the next thing happen. Being has a stability to it, right? And in that sense of being, there's really a growing sense of being um, connected with everything. You know, the edges start softening. You start opening out. You feel more open and diffuse. It's happening. You know where your, you know, <laughs> arm is and where the shirt is, and you know you know you don't walk into doors. But more and more, as you rest in being, there's a sense of being a rippling local expression of everything. And as you rest in that sense of that, you're more and more undisturbed by whatever passes through awareness. So here too, are you deepening in this practice of simply being? Open, spacious, aware, simply being. That's a cultivation. And as it deepens, many people report, including ultimately the Buddha, and I can report as well, there's a growing sense of all this happening in an underlying ground, mysterious, difficult to talk about, that is unconditioned. All these conditioned phenomena that constitute you are occurring or appearing um, in a ground that is always just prior to whatever is appearing, eternally prior to whatever is appearing, with a quality the Buddha called unconditioned. Others speak of it as timeless or absolute. Or in Taoism, a, an, a sense of absence uh, as the ground of presence continuously, the two together. And that sense of absence or timelessness or unconditioned or unconditionality is the ultimate ground of equanimity because it's undisturbed there. Nothing can disturb it. It's not numb or apathy. It's not apathy. It's just a fundamental basis that enables equanimity, which includes certainly the capacity. All this is not about checking out. It's about what does it take to retain a warm and passionate heart in a fairly fucked up world? I almost never swear <laughs> as a teacher. <laughs> But isn't it true? How do you keep your heart open? How do you love others? How do you make your way in the rough and tumble of relationships with virtue, with morality, with commitment to justice, doing the best you can, helping your friends and your loved ones along the way? How do you do that? Equanimity, incredibly useful quality. So I want to finish, now that I've maybe <laughs> spun out into the ether a little bit, I want to finish with some ways of looking at others, ways of talking to yourself about others, ways of talking to yourself about yourself. And, uh, you know, I want to bring it down to earth. These are pretty earthy here. Uh, it was some perhaps slightly snarky tips. And then we'll open it up and see if there's some comments here. <laughs> okay, so here's some, here's some here's some thoughts that I consider to be at least friend of equanimity, right? Um, <clears throat> just because you have a problem 
doesn't mean it's my problem. That's a kind of equanimity. Just because you have a problem doesn't mean it's mine. Doesn't necessarily mean it's mine. Imagine claiming to yourself the right to think these thoughts when it's appropriate and to believe them. Okay? Here's another one. It's really not that big a deal. I don't mean this in a way that's contemptuous or disdainful. It puts others down. I mean it as a kind of look at it, like something will happen. You know, you'll break a dish. You're doing the dishes, you break a dish. And like, ugh, you know. Try not to break dishes, but it's not that big a deal. Uh, things happen in work. You know, I'm doing stuff, I'm working. Something doesn't come through or I mess up, I make a mistake. It's not that big a deal, really. It's not that big a deal. Think of all the things that we make big deals. It's not that big a deal. Do you have the right to say and decide for yourself what's a big deal and what's not, including in the face of other people who are telling you that's a big deal or you've internalized over the years. So they're like, somebody got mad. No, that's a big deal. Well, maybe it's not that big a deal. Oh, I made a mistake. I was wrong. Oh, it's a big deal. Maybe it's not such a big deal. Here's another one. Let it go. Let it go. I find myself, I'm getting caught up in a wrangle about something. Let it go. Or I, met, I did make a mistake. And in fact, there's something that's worthy of some, let's say, remorse on my part. And you know, I've been anguished about it long enough. I've racked myself again and again. Why did I do that? I've tried to learn all I can. I've made amends. Think about this for yourself. At some point, you just say, let it go. Let it go. Not prematurely, not trying to deny moral responsibility, but just some things you can say to yourself, let it go. That's equanimity. Let it go. Here's another one. I wish you well, but I'm not responsible for that. I'm not responsible for that. I'm not saying that um, I hate you or, you know, I'm going to be mean or I'm going to, you know, try to hurt you. It's just that I'm not responsible. You, you think I'm responsible. <laughs> I'm not responsible for that. I didn't make that happen. I did not have a relevant duty in that regard. It wasn't my job to make sure that didn't happen. I, I agree. It would be good if that, whatever it was, um, happened next time. And I'm happy to look to the future about how we could make that happen next time or how I could make sure that happens next time. But meanwhile, no, actually, I, I wasn't responsible for that. You have the right to say that. Here's another one. I'm going to be more skillful in the future, but I don't deserve to, or I don't need to, feel bad about what happened. That's equanimity too. There's a correction to put in maybe, or there's some learning, how to be more effective, more skillful, uh, more recognizing of what another person is taking into account that you don't have to take into account. But, you know, I'm not a bad person because I didn't know that at the time. It, it wasn't a moral fault. I don't deserve to feel guilty. I don't need to feel guilt or remorse here or shame. You might want me to feel that. I don't take that on board. And, yeah, I'm going to learn something here. I'm even happy to make an agreement with you about the future. But it's not because I was a bad person or did something bad. That's equanimity too. Here's another one. I wish you well, but I'm not implicated in your mind stream. Now that's total nerdy for me, 
I'm not implicated in your mind stream. And again, I don't mean it in any kind of a haughty way. For me, it's been really helpful because by my nature, I'm, I'm very empathic and I have a caring heart. Um, and I, I'm eager to figure out how, how I could do better next time. But I've started to really realize that a lot of people construct reactions of various kinds that they blame you for, they blame me for, that actually, honestly, <laughs> they're making it up. I'm not implicated, right? And I wish them well. And also I can decide whether I'm gonna do something about what they're feeling, but I'm not implicated in it. It's not mine, you know? You might think about that, especially if you tend to feel overly implicated in other people's mind stream. Now, maybe you're someone who's overly detached and kind of cold and heck with them. Well, maybe <laughs> you want to feel a little more implicated sometimes, especially if you're walking roughshod on them, for sure. But for a lot of people, oh boy, what a pathway to equanimity to just realize you, you have your karmas. You have your life. You are a wave next to me. I wish you well. And I got... I got my own stuff to deal with over here. I have my own wave. And what I owe you maybe is limited, if anything at all. And I'm not implicated in, in the causes and conditions that are making you right now. That's equanimity. And then last one, really important. I can only make my own sincere efforts with a good heart and learning along the way. After that, it's out of my hands. I've been reflecting lately on what we're called to. What is, what's our job as a human being? And for me, it, it, there really are three central aspects. Maybe there are more, but these are three that really, really land for me. And there are questions for you. And you can apply them to any day or any hour or minute or breath in a day or any decade or any life. Fundamentally, have I had a good heart? You know? And going forward, can I bring good heartedness, open heartedness, warm heartedness, a fundamental stance of, of compassion and caring and kindness and wholeheartedness, uh, being you know, ardent, courageous, bringing my whole heart to it, right? We can, we can call ourselves to that. Whatever the past may have been, can you call yourself to a wholeheartedness, a good heartedness in your next encounter, with the next person you see or the next movement as you go through your day? Second, second, are you making sincere efforts? Are you trying? Try the capability of one person could be very different than the capability of another person to make efforts because of what they have to take into account. Within the range of the efforts you can make, have you made efforts? Have you worked at it? Have you put in a day's work? Have you tried? A lot of people, even with a good heart, they don't make much effort. There's no substitute for a work ethic. Oh, it doesn't mean you have to beat yourself up along the way. It, it means for a lot of people that they can give themselves credit. Yeah, I made efforts today. You know, I, and I made efforts today to the point that, you know, I can clock out. That's the second thing, effort, sincere effort. And then third, have you been learning along the way? Or going forward, can you learn? And when we can know, you know, that in a relationship, in our job, in our career, in our home, in our day, that we brought our heart to it and made reasonable effort and learned. And we're open to learning along the way, including correcting, correction for the future and repair. Then we can find equanimity in what we did today. Even with the baubles, even with the mistakes and the dropped balls and this and that, we can rest in a fundamental equanimity of personal worth. Yeah, you have a good heart. 
Yeah. You work at it. You try. You keep going. And you're open to learning. You grow. You heal, you repair, you grow along the way. Yeah. Fundamental, fundamental pillars of equanimity. Good heartedness, effort, and learning. So I invite you, as I finish here, in the week to come, to really consider your own equanimity and the factors of it. Make equanimity a value. Find that sense of underlying stability, of undisturbed awareness and peacefulness and open-heartedness, through which all kinds of stuff's flowing underneath it all. And it, at its depths, finding a kind of stillness in the ongoingness of that field. It's good practice for this week. And I really commend to you, if you're here, unless you're really, really being tricky, probably not, you have a good heart. You're making effort and you're learning along the way. So let's bring it to a formal end. Next week, I'm going to deliberately start by saying a few things and then really make a lot of room for questions and discussion. And I'll make room for talking with people live as well as taking questions and comments coming through. And. Um, so I just want to finish here by encouraging us all to rest and appreciate growing equanimity on the basis of which we can keep rocking in the free world. So you take good care.